Hello and good morning to everyone joining us from Asia and a pleasant evening to everyone dialing in from the United States and the Western Hemisphere. We hope you and your families are all well. My name is Regina Lay. I'm a broadcast journalist and I will be your moderator for this session. The topic for the seminar is the post-COVID outlook for developing Asia. It's a particularly interesting one because on the one hand, we seem to be in much better shape than the same time last year, right? Most places have at least uh, emerged from a long COVID lockdown and we've more or less resumed our lives. On the other hand, the world that we re-emerged into is, um, well, shall we say fraught with challenges. So certainly there is much to talk about. Just to quickly lay out the session's order, we're gonna have each of our three panelists do their initial interventions for five minutes, after which we'll go straight into the open forum. And with that, let me bring in our first panelist. I'm speaking to Joanna Chua, the Managing Director and Head of Asia Pacific Economic and Market Analysis at Citigroup. Based in Hong Kong since 2000, Joanna oversees economic research across Asia the Pacific, including China, India, Korea, the frontier Asian, Asian markets, as well as developed economies like Japan and Australia. Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Regina, and I'm very privileged to be here today. Um, I have a few slides, so maybe I'd like to just point out on the next next slide, please, and uh, the third slide number three, uh, slide number two. Um, so basically, we think we are in a very, very challenging backdrop for the global outlook. We actually think there's now 50% of a global recession. We think the recession pressure is most magnified in Europe, including parts of uh, also parts of Latin America and then US more towards the second half of next year. So going into the next slide, obviously the slowdown in the global backdrop is going to be very challenging for Asia, particularly in terms of the transmission of the slowdown via trade. And Asia is a very disparate region. We have some of these small open economies like Singapore, Korea, you know, Vietnam, Malaysia, very exposed to external slowdown. And obviously to varying degrees. And we have countries like Indonesia, India, less exposed. And China, historically less exposed, but probably this time is going to be more uh, exposed than it had been in the past. But we have a very a little bit of a differentiated story, and that is China, because we think even though China is also going to be vulnerable to the slowdown headwinds from the rest of the world, uh, we think that after party Congress going into next year, the opportunity to change from and shift away from its dynamic zero COVID, and we are also expecting better or faster implementation of policy ex execution once the political calendar is past us, could allow a recovery of China's growth next year, which provides a little bit more of a positive spillover to this region relative to the rest. So even though we have a very uh, kind of gloomy outlook for next year, uh, especially with recessions and rolling recessions in Asia, with the exception of some of the frontier markets like Sri Lanka or Korea with a 50% probability of a recession, we actually do not have any recession envisioned for any other markets in Asia. And I think the other big story is the next slide, clearly COVID, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Um, clearly COVID and the desynchronization of the reopening and the impact of the, the lockdown and reopening is a major factor creating a lot of idiosyncrasies in the way in which the momentum, the tailwind from economic reopening is offsetting some of the headwinds from the kind of the external led slowdown. And clearly the tourism arrival is helping parts of Southeast Asia and helping recover some of the domestic mobility driving retail sales. And I think the other thing that has been a, a factor that has created a bit of desynchronization is to the extent that greater China has an extended uh, more strict uh, lockdown measures, that has actually created opportunities uh, in the manufacturing sector, which is in the next slide, where we do see belatedly after significant CapEx disruption over the last couple of years, continued uh, positive signals of some CapEx revival uh, in parts of ASEAN and parts of Asia, particularly in Vietnam, India, and Malaysia. And that's helping provide a bit of a desynchronization. So overall, if you look at the next slide, despite all the doom and gloom that we have about global recession risk and external led slowdown, in fact, the picture in Asia is very, very varied. You still have parts of Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, like Malaysia, like Philippines, uh, like Singapore, which is benefiting from the services migration from Hong Kong. You still have these reopening tailwinds that are providing a bit of a buffer to, this, to the economy, while more cyclical economies are feeling more of the headwinds. But of course, over time, we will not be able to completely insulate ourselves from the global risk. But this is the outlook at the moment, quite differentiated. Next slide. Now, inflation is obviously a big, big concern. I think global central banks now has taken a big cue that they need to be more aggressive and front-loaded in its rate hikes. 
in order to address or avert a worse outcome. And I think that's been the lesson from Jackson Hole. And we are definitely seeing inflation surprises starting to decelerate in a number of the region. But I think the challenge for a lot of central banks and including Asia is that an important driver of inflation. And for us to actually have a soft landing, if we can get a soft landing, is we really need to see more supply side disinflationary drivers be very meaningful. And unfortunately, despite some of the deceleration of oil prices, the fact that what's happening now with Russia and the escalation of concerns about natural gas, and the fact that we've had a lot of weather anomalies, droughts, floods, erratic monsoon in India, created a lot of pressure in some of the food prices means that perhaps disinflationary pressures uh, that's coming from some of the supply side factors might take a little bit of longer. And that obviously will create some stickiness. Next slide. So again, food and fuel is going to be a very, very important driver. We think for most of Asia, at least for the fuel side, City has a relatively bearish oil price view. So we do think oil price will continue to decelerate to $75 a barrel on average by next year, even hovering to in the 50 plus barrel or oil price barrel in the subsequent years. So we think oil will be an important driver of this inflation. On the other hand, we have energy, other energy prices that need to factor, factor in. Certainly things related to gas and coal could impact electricity, but a lot of these prices are also more regulated and in some cases have a lower weight than fuel. The complication factors, we do need to watch food, which varies. But again, by and large, these are, I think, still a stagflation risk is still a concern. A slowdown risk continue to emanate, but inflation may mean sticky. Even though it's down from the peak, it may be sticky for a little bit longer. Next slide. So right now, our view is that for Asia, most of our headline inflation is expected to peak around 3Q this year, maybe some even 4Q. China is a little bit belated to 1Q next year. So we are already at peaking inflation which could give an opportunity for a peak of hawkishness of central bank. The only challenge here is even though we are peaking in inflation, in a number of markets, inflation is still coming down from a relatively high level. And the, the, the pace of deceleration is going to be impacted by a lot of uncertainties, both on the commodity side, both on what's happening to global demand, and also the China reopening and how that's going to impact as well. Next slide. So we have to be mindful of risks of inflation being more pervasive and spreading forward. But I think if you kind of fast forward, given the limited time, slide number 17, uh, um, the only thing I would want to say is that if you look at slide number 17, uh, you will see despite this worry about inflation, uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, First of all, so first of all, at least for Asia, we don't have as tight labor markets as some of what we're seeing in advanced economies, with the exception of a few like Singapore. But if you can go to slide number 17, please. Okay, I just wanted to point out that even though we're very worried about a hawkish bias of global central banks with the worry about stagflation and inflation, I think even though, for example, the Fed, we expect the Fed will raise rates up to four and a half percent and other markets will have to raise even above neutral, which is our view for a lot of developed markets in Asia, including likes of Korea. For now, we think even though this inflation had been most of Asia central banks in the middle to lower income, we are not expecting rates. So we are expecting rate normalization, but we don't expect normalization of rates beyond neutral at this standpoint. And even though inflation is picking up, I think we are seeing some signs of peaking of inflation uh, headline, relatively well anchored long term inflation expectations. And unlike in the past, a lot of Asian central banks have a lot more better balance sheets. So the ability to withstand this environment of a strong dollar and FX volatility and therefore no need to amplify or excessively hike interest rates significantly beyond neutral in a lot of the mainstream economies. Of course, the challenge is for the more frontier, more fragile economies like uh, Sri Lanka and Pakistan, the, the, the situation there is obviously different. And with that, you know, I look forward to the discussions. And I think I'll just end here and pass it on to the next speaker. 50% chance of a global recession. That's quite the gloomy outlook, Joanna. We're going to unpack that a little bit later on. For now, let's get on to the next speaker. We've got Krishna Srinivasan. He's the director of the Asian Pacific Department at the IMF. Krishna oversees the IMF's work on all countries in the Asia Pacific, including several systemically important countries like China and Korea. He had been the IMF's mission chief for the United Kingdom and Israel and had led the IMF's work on the G20 in the context of the global financial crisis. He's also an editor of an IMF book, The Global Rebalancing, a Roadmap for Economic Recovery. So we're hoping, Krishna, you would have some answers for us. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Regina. 
Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to the seminar. I'll, I'll start with a short uh, presentation on ec recent economic developments and the policy environment, and then turn to medium challenges facing Asia. Uh, slide two, please. So let me begin by saying that the three main downside risks we flagged in the World Economic Outlook in April have now materialized. First, we have continu we've continued to see high and volatile commodity prices, and these are passing through into consumer prices. As the left graph shows, inflation in the second quarter overwhelmingly surprised on the upside in the majority of countries. Almost everywhere, inflation is now running well above central bank targets. Second, as the middle graph shows, China's zero COVID policy had a serious impact on economic activity in quarter two, with extensive lockdowns and PMI declines unseen since early 2020. Although production activities are rebounding, the recovery in mobility is still weak. Third, financial conditions are tightening as major central banks' monetary policy normalization continue. This will also have implications for emerging markets since domestic financial conditions. As the right graph shows, Asia's emerging and developing economies have seen significantly increased sovereign yields, suggesting increased costs of fiscal financing. As a result of all this, all three main engines of global growth, the US, the EU, and China, accounting for roughly 60% of global GDP, are now stalling. This has deep consequences for the remaining 40% of the global economy. Next slide, please. As these downside results risks have materialized, we have further downgraded our growth forecast across the globe. In our July update to the World Economic Outlook, global growth is forecast to be 3.2% for 2022 and 2.9% 2 for 2023, which is about 0.4 and 0.7 percentage points for the, uh, lower than from our April uh, World Economic Outlook. Since our July updates, revisions continue to be negative with headwinds from persistent inflation and tighter financial conditions and weak growth in China, which bodes as board very well for growth forecasts uh, going forward. Slide four, please. Head. In terms of a further factor driving additional downgrades is the ongoing war in Ukraine. While the global economy showed significant resilience in the first six months since the invasion of Ukraine, headwinds from the war are starting to be felt in the real economy in Asia and Pacific. External demand has held up reasonably well, despite the slowdown in China, driven by the US and EU uh, growth there. Commodity prices surged shortly after the war, but have since eased, and especially in the last few months. However, manufacturing, uh, uh, and even though manufacturing activity has developed surprisingly well thus far in Asia, if you look at PMIs, uh, they remain weak, suggesting a slowing of exports in the near term. So again, prospects going forward don't look as promising as what we saw in the, in the, in the first part of the year. In terms of slide, uh, next slide, please. For central banks, the strength of the monetary policy normalization will depend on the inflation outlook. To guide policy, it will be particularly important to monitor the persistence of inflation and the extent to which inflation expectations are anchored. Now, uh, on the left panel, you will notice how our forecast for headline inflation in the US and Euro area and Asia have all been revised higher for longer over the past eight months. In our latest forecast, the spike in US inflation is expected to be contained following the uh, hawkish uh, Fed monetary tightening, while inflation in the Euro area and Asia is anticipated rise more than we projected in our April forecast. In economies that have managed uh, or fixed exchange rates, monetary policy has been tightened in lockstep with, with the Federal Reserve. Among the economies with more flexible exchange rate regimes, approaches reflect a substantial heterogeneity in the inflation growth outlooks across the region. Overall, most economies are undertaking both monetary and fiscal normalization in tandem. In the right panel, we note the fiscal measures that have been deployed to cushion the impact of higher food and fuel prices on the most vulnerable in the population. However, in some cases, subsidies and fuel have been less targeted. Therefore, authorities should recalibrate fiscal support measures and unwind those that are fiscally costly. This will be even more important as real interest rates rise, given high existing debt levels across the region. In fact, debt, reach, debt levels in Asia and the Pacific have risen the most across all uh, compared to other parts uh, of the world. Now, let me turn to the medium, medium term challenges facing the region. Firstly, scarring following the pandemic, and secondly, the risks of geoeconomic fragmentation. Slide, next slide, please. The COVID-19 pandemic is expected to have a lasting effect on GDP globally. These charts show the percent deviation GDP in 2024 between the pre-COVID VO projections and regions. No region is expected to reach its pandemic level of GDP by 2024, 
but these output losses are largest for Asia. This picture is similar if you, if you use projections from other forecasters, such as the Economic Intelligence Unit of the Economics. The right panel shows a breakdown of the income level, highlighting that these scarring effects are concentrated in emerging market and developing economies, with these economies in Asia particularly hard hit. Uh, these output losses are also particularly severe in tourism dependent economies and those with high debt. While exact policy responses will depend on the country specific circumstances, tackling corporate debt overhang and mitigating human capital losses will be important for a wide range of countries in the region. In addition, faster adoption of digital technologies can mitigate the adverse effects of the pandemic on productivity and, and improve resilience in the labor market. Next slide, please. This is on fragmentation. Over the past few decades, greater trade integration and the rise of global value chains have boosted global growth, particularly, but have also resulted in economies becoming increasingly interdependent. Against this backdrop of integration, we have the counter current of economic fragmentation resulting in higher trade policy uncertainty and trade restrictions. There was a significant increase uh, in new trade restrictions imposed since 2018, coinciding with the US-China trade tensions, but these have continued to rise in recent years. The sectoral composition of trade restrictions has also been shifting. The share of, restriction, of restrictions that, that target high-tech sectors has been steadily increasing since the global financial crisis, potentially reflecting the increasingly prominent role of these sectors in both economic competition and national security. In the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, restrictions targeting the energy sector increased sharply while those aimed at high-tech sectors also remain high. Our analysis finds potentially very large economic losses for the world as a whole, and especially for Asia, if these trends towards greater fragmentation continue, especially in the sharpest fragmentation scenario where the world divides into distinct blocks. Active engagement and dialogue between policymakers around the world, including multilateral fora, will be vital to roll back trade restrictions reduce policy uncertainty, and ensure that trade continues to act as an engine of growth. The last slide, I'll stop here and look forward to discussing these issues with you in the rest of the session. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Krishna. Lots of insightful points there that, as you said, we will hash out shortly. And now we're going to move on to our last speaker. We've got Albert Park. He is the Chief Economist and Director General of the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department at the ADB. Albert is Chief Spokesperson on Economic and Development Trends and leads the production of ADB's flagship knowledge products and support for regional cooperation fora. Albert has more than two decades of experience as a development economist, ec economist rather, and is also a well-known expert on China. Albert, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I want to start by providing uh, a summary of our most recent forecasts for growth in developing Asia. Uh, these were just released last week. And uh, the headline number is that we are adjusting our expected growth in Asia downward from 5.2% this year to 4.3%. Uh, and next year uh, from 5.3% to 4.9%. Our uh, forecast for inflation is increasing uh, from 3.7% projected earlier this year to 4.5% uh, for 2022. And next year we expect also inflation to be higher. We're upgrading our estimate from 3.1% to 4%. So one thing worth noting here is that if you look at uh, developing Asia excluding China, Actually, the reduction in forecast growth is much smaller. It's from 5.3% to 5.3%. So a big part of our downward adjustment is the growth slowdown in China. And I think that reflects a kind of resilience of recovery in Asia in a very challenging global environment. And so we do not expect a recession uh, in Asia. We do not have negative growth predictions for any country except for Sri Lanka. Um, and so hopefully that can provide some momentum for the global economy. Uh, the next thing I wanted to focus on is the challenge of poverty and inequality in the post-pandemic period. Um, obviously here at the ADB, those are our core missions to make growth inclusive and to reduce poverty. And uh, we've released earlier estimates that the pandemic increased poverty by 
extreme poverty by 75 to 80 million uh, people and set back the progress against poverty by two years. Uh, but those are estimates just based on simulations uh, where we just increase the incomes of uh, across the distribution um, uh, for and then estimate what the poverty rates would be. Uh, we don't actually have new survey data because it's been hard to collect data during and after the pandemic. Uh, and so uh, it could be that the poverty uh, setbacks were even worse. We kind of expect that informal workers, less skilled workers, women um, would have been hurt more by the pandemic. They had left less access to technology to be able to work from home. Um, they were in sectors, service sectors that were often um, hit harder by mobility restrictions. We know that children uh, who uh, had to uh, suffer the school closures, um, if they were in poor families, had a much difficult, more difficult time accessing technologies, uh, et cetera. Um, and so it was disequalizing. Um, and if we think about what that means going forward, uh, it means that we have to really uh, concentrate if we're going to continue making product progress on the sustainable development goals for poverty reduction. Um, we actually feel that if uh, the region can remain, uh, maintain its growth momentum, that uh, enormous progress can still be made in eliminating nearly all extreme poverty by the year 2030. But that will take continued progress. Um, there's a few areas of the growth strategy and development strategy that need attention to make this happen. One is uh, social protection systems need to be improved. They expanded a lot during the pandemic and some countries really innovated in terms of digitalization and cross-sector coordination. More of that needs to happen because many countries still struggle to cover the informal sector in particular. In addition, uh, immediate efforts need to be made to remediate the learning losses experienced by children who uh, could not go to school for extended period of, periods of time. We estimate that the average child in Asia uh, was out of school for 272 days, and this will cost them about 6% of their lifetime earnings. And we've created recommendations on how to address this by measuring the learning loss, trying to teach to the level of the student, encouraging re-enrollment for kids who have dropped out of school, uh, concentrating the curriculum, and perhaps extending school time. Um, also, there are two other major forces that are important for future inclusive growth. One is digitalization, which we know can be particularly helpful to uh, households living in remote areas and for small and medium enterprises. But this requires that they uh, have access to the internet and also that they have supportive um, efforts to learn about how to take advantage of those opportunities and improve their digital literacy. And then finally, we believe that globalization and multilateral trade is still an important recipe for uh, poverty reduction and inclusive growth. We know that many poor countries can gain opportunities to specialize in production in different parts of the value chain when uh, trade is facilitated. And we hope that the, the Regional Economic Partnership Agreement a comprehensive economic partnership agreement can help facilitate that uh, going forward. Uh, we've always been supportive of regional economic integration at the A to B as uh, one of uh, important part of the recipe for uh, development. Thank you so much, Albert. All great points as well. At this point, I'd like to bring in everyone else, all the rest of the panelists back in so we could kick off the open forum. Now, as we keep saying, there is much to unpack here. So I've structured the discussion around three pillars, near-term challenges, medium-term shifts, and long-term goals. Let's begin with the near-term challenges, which are pretty obvious and which you've all touched on. The hardship that the war in Ukraine has caused has been so profound, right? You only need to look at the headlines. We're talking energy price spikes and uh, runaway inflation and stock market routes. And that's true for most of the world, not just in Asia. After seven months, you would think we've had enough, but then you suddenly have Vladimir Putin saying that we're gonna mobilize more troops and that we're gonna use quote unquote, all means available to defend Russia. 
what should we make of all of this? And are we coming into or should we be bracing for a period of stagflation and or social unrest? Joe, um, I'm going to begin with you because you touched on this in your PowerPoint. And after that, I'll have Krishna and then Albert weigh in as well. Sure. Um, definitely. I think we are going into a period of stagflation. And the hope and our goal and our base case is that is a transitory stagflation. Because right now, I think what's going to happen, despite a lot of concerted effort of global central banks to accelerate or front load some of the rate tightening, the reality is growth is probably going to slow down faster or earlier, while inflation coming securely back to its target path may take a little bit longer. Because as you said, when you have these repeated supply shocks, the policy trade-off becomes harder and it takes longer for some of these inflationary pressures to decelerate. So the slowdown is going to manifest itself more. But the reason why we think it's transitory is we're expecting that since a number of central banks are going to have to go above neutral or keep rates on hold for a lot longer, uh, the hope is that by next year, even though we're still above the inflation target, uh, we are going to be at a path towards hitting the inflation target by 2024. So the expectation is by first quarter of 2023, even some by the fourth quarter of 2022, we may be already hitting the, the peak of the rate hiking cycle. Of course, let's hope it's not a false peak and we don't get more supply shock, but that's our base case at the moment. So once you can get to the peak earlier uh, and not to be uber tight, the hope is that maybe you'll have a couple of quarters of recession, but I hope, I'm hoping that overall, globally, it will be more of a transitory stagflation. And that's pretty much what Albert said. In the case of Asia, it's a bit different because we have this a little bit of an opposite dynamic where you do have a little bit of uh, resilience in some of the economies. We are hoping that the China is kind of a counter cyclical buffer to the slowdown elsewhere. It's just it's just debate now is how big of a counter cyclical growth buffer is China going to be? And at least our outlook of China, even as China reopens, we are hoping that the China reopening is not going to be reflationary enough to make the monetary policy trade off for global central banks to even be worse. That's the hope. So right now, I think transitory stagflation. And of course, when you talk about social unrest, I mean, there's always pockets of vulnerabilities here and there. But, you know, again, that really depends on a case by case basis. Thanks. Krishna. Uh, thank, thank you, Krishna. I think what we've seen is we've seen one crisis after another. So we've been in a situation where we've been having crisis after a crisis. And that you can see, and, you know, it's reflected in higher inflation. Uh, slowing growth. And uh, as, as Joanna said, central banks are tightening a monetary policy quite sharply. And, uh, you know, one would hope that interest rates, I mean, sorry, inflation would come down uh, by next year. But at the same time, what we also see is that growth is slowing across most parts of the world. Uh, I mean, even, even in, in Asia, for instance, despite the growth slowing, we see positive growth across most parts of the world. The, the question, of course, in my mind is, um, with, inf with policy rates tightening across uh, most parts of the world, fiscal consolidation happening to keep in tandem with monetary policy, what could be the implications for the region? And here I worry about the fact that uh, given that debt uh, in Asia, I'm talking about public debt, corporate debt, household debt, has increased quite sharply bet before between pre-pandemic and now, what does the, all this mean for, for debt uh, in the region? And I, I worry about debt distress across uh, parts of, of the region. Albert? Um, I'll just jump in. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, the comments that have been made. I mean, I think if the war is prolonged uh, and it is more disruptive to energy supply, obviously, uh, this is going to increase the inflationary pressure. It's going to increase the likelihood of more uh, higher and more aggressive interest rate hikes uh, in the U.S. and other major economies, and that's going to matter for Asia. It's going to reduce external demand. It's going to put financial pressure on many countries, as was mentioned, including countries that maybe are hitting the margins of uh, struggling with debt sustainability. It's going to create more pressure. And so uh, it's not something uh, we hope for. At the same time, I think we're all in expectation hoping that energy prices will actually moderate next year. Um, our projections were that the oil price would be somewhat high, still at $95, not $50, like Joanna said. Uh, and even in those conditions, we felt that growth should, could be sustained. There's also a lot of um, other responses occurring in the region in terms of uh, 
finding alternative supplies uh, to uh, deal with the energy shortages. Um, so, for instance, uh, Europe is trying to diversify its gas sources, liquid natural gas from the U.S., uh, shipping more gas from Azerbaijan and other countries in Central Asia. And that hopefully uh, there will be kind of an adjustment process too, which could also perhaps mitigate uh, the effect of prolonged war. I mean, we are not, even if the war ended, we're projecting that sanctions would continue. So um, it's really just a matter uh, well into next year. And so our projections already kind of incorporate that. So it's really whether uh, the war, uh, an escalation of the war creates shocks that we haven't even foreseen. And let's just cross our fingers that that doesn't happen. Sorry, Albert, can I just clarify that you think oil coming back down to $50 a barrel is not happening anytime soon? Our baseline forecast is $95 next year, uh, which okay. uh, assumes that there will be no supply. But I, uh, of course, there's huge uncertainty about that. Right, right. And Regina, just to correct, don't, I don't did you want to say $50. something? I no, I don't, I don't expect it. That's more 2023. That's even longer, 2024. So we have $75 a barrel for 2023. And then our medium okay, long term big... is down to 50. Yes. <laughs> right. So it's still a big discrepancy there. We're talking more or less $20 difference in your forecast. Um, but, anyways, Krishna, I wanted to come back to something you said earlier. And your biggest worry is uh, the higher debt burdens all across Asia. Sri Lanka is obviously a very big cautionary tale, right? And in fact, the ADB is a very one of the key lenders to them. How do they even begin to get out of this mess, right? And more importantly, what lessons can policymakers take away from, from this scenario, from the situation? So, so I think one issue here, I think we, which we which I touched upon briefly, is also in Asia we are concerned about what's going to happen in China, right? China's growth has slowed down, slowed down quite significantly. We had it at three point three percent in July forecast, and and that has a significant bearing on on the rest of Asia in terms of what's happening to uh, you know because China is so important as part of the global supply chain and also in terms of how uh, other economies interact uh, with China. Now, of course, debt is a clear issue. I mean, I, as I mentioned, I don't have exact figures in front of me, but uh, I've seen public debt uh, and, you know, housing and corporate debt rising across uh, uh, many parts of Asia. Again, it varies country to country. In some countries, there's a corporate debt, in some countries, it's public debt. And I think it's important to keep in mind that um, it could get worse because, you know, with infl with the uh, uh, central banks tightening interest rates across the world. Financial tightening uh, is going to it's going to be it's going to intensify in Asia. Growth is slowing, so with growth slowing, interest rates rising, your debt situation is going to get uh, that much more difficult. I think it's in that context when we talk about uh, policy advice for countries, we are saying that we see the impact of energy and food on 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 the vulnerable segments of the population. So what we would what what we would advise countries to do is yes. Uh, cut down on generalized subsidies and so on. You have to maintain a fiscal uh, consolidation position going forward, given uh, uh, high debt levels. Protect the vulnerable by giving targeted subsidies. But more generally, when you have limited fiscal space, you have to keep uh, on the path of fiscal consolidation. Now, that seems harsh to do when growth is slowing, but the problem is that many countries in the region have high debt levels. And so I worry both about, you know, uh, problems in public balance sheets and also in balance sheets across households and corporates, which could intensify with interest rates uh, rising and growth slowing. The problem with cutting subsidies is that it's highly unpopular, of course, and um, you need only to look at a country like the Philippines, where in every time there's talk of cutting back fuel subsidies, people take to the streets. So again, I let me throw the question back to you. What can policymakers do about it? So I think, again, it's all a question of targeting subsidies, right? I think generalized subsidies are clearly uh, not the most efficient way to go do things. Pricing has to play an important role. And I think where uh, where uh, the population is, is struggling with higher uh, food and fuel prices, it's very important to, to uh, be more targeted. And again, here, I think a point which uh, Albert made and also which I touched upon is, you know, countries have used uh, digitalization to target support. I think I would emphasize that. I think when you think about targeting, uh, 
you have to think in terms of how to use uh, modern technology, uh, digital technology to better charge subsidies. Because I think while I agree that you know uh, people are facing difficulties, there's also an issue of limited fiscal space, high levels of debt. How do you balance that? So you know we've, we've seen countries going into uh, much more difficult situations. Uh, you mentioned Sri Lanka, and that's a case in point where uh, you know you have uh, you know things getting out of control. So you want to maintain a fiscal stance which is responsible while taking into account the impact of food and uh, fuel prices on the poor and vulnerable. So targeted subsidies is the way to go. And where you provide such subsidies, also I think it's important to make sure that it's budget neutral to the extent possible, cut where you can uh, to provide such targeted subsidies so that overall your fiscal situation doesn't blow up. That's a great point about making sure it's budget neutral. Um, so growth is slowing, financial conditions are tightening, everyone's in agreement. Now the question, the other thing everyone wants to know is, is a recession inevitable, particularly in the US, right? I mean, TV pundits everywhere are already calling it. And even if you don't listen to them, you also have people like former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers saying they might be in for a hard landing. So how should we in Asia look at this situation? Joanne, I'm gonna to go to you on this and then to Albert. Okay, so first of all, I mean, uh, soft landings are extremely rare. <laughs> Achieving that is very rare. And at this level of uh, un inflation rate and this level of unemployment rate or tightness of the labor market, where there are two job openings for every unemployed person, I think uh, the ability to avoid a recession is obviously very, very difficult. And our base case in the U.S. now is we are going to get a recession, probably more in the second half of next year. But the nature of recession in the U.S. is different from how we expect a recession unfolding in Europe. Like for Europe, it's mostly driven by this huge exogenous shock driven by energy prices. It's obviously going to have a huge hit on you know, discretionary incomes across households and corporates that is further amplified by the other inflationary and central bank tightening. In the U.S., we expect is in order for inflation, to, because the economy is so resilient, in order for inflation to really come down in U.S. towards the anchor, you really need people really need to lose jobs. I think that is the assumption. And the question is, it's going to be very hard to engineer that towards a 2%, given that you know, you know, we have core inflation up running above 6% at the moment. Uh, so we think it's going to be very hard. And so we think it's, it's more trying to figure out how high is the terminal Fed policy rate going to be. The challenge with that is that because what's driving it is the tightness in the labor market. And because we have a lot of activity shifting from goods to more labor intensive services, even as U.S. economy is slowing down, the labor market is not loosening enough because services sector is also still quite resilient. That's taking a longer time to transmit. The other challenge that we also have in the U.S. is that, you know, a lot of U.S. corporate balance sheets have a lot of intangible capital rather than tangible capital. So less plant and equipment, more software, R&D, IP, this stuff that tends to be less interest rate sensitive. So it's going to take a little bit. You need financial conditions to really tighten, to really transmit itself. And then the other challenge for the U.S. in the transmission is, you know, housing and mortgage in the U.S. Housing market is a very important transmission mechanism for tighter monetary policy. But in U.S., a lot of households have long-term fixed mortgages. It just takes a little bit longer. So the challenge here, and this is why I think it's hard to avoid a U.S. recession, is because you know, we need to figure out what's the magic formula to get inflation down. And if it means you're going to have to keep rates higher and longer, a lot longer, then certainly the risk of a recession, I think, at this our base case, is going to be very hard to avoid. Well, I'm, Albert? maybe I can jump in. Yeah, so... It's a bit, a little bit trying to read tea leaves in terms of <laughs> knowing whether there will be a recession or won't be a recession. I mean, the markets are, you know, expecting a 75 point basis point increase this time uh, and probably some further increases up to uh, four or four and a half percent. And then as a peak kind of interest rate. And uh, if that's uh, that's baked in to some extent, and if that is what actually happens, I think. Those are levels which I think uh, uh, Asian economies can kind of adjust to. And of course, uh, if the U.S. Uh, goes into recession, it creates a big negative demand shock. So it's going to pull down growth substantially. We've done one. Uh, we've done one scenario analysis where if the basis point increase was higher by, let's say, one point two percent to five percent, then growth in Asia would slow by an additional 1.3%, uh, I believe. Um, and so 
costly. But again, uh, there's still a fair amount of resilience in what's happening in Asia. So from from the perspective of where Asia is, it's really just kind of wait and see what happens, but be ready uh, to uh, to adjust policies appropriately. That's good advice right there. Um, I want to keep at it, but we are already short on time, so I have to move on to other topics. And the other big issue within Asia is um, China's policies, of course. The question there has always been zero COVID at what price, right? The self-imposed isolation in pursuit of zero COVID cases has really made it a lot less, uh, shall we say, competitive, and it's dragging its neighbors down. Um, Albert mentioned this earlier, that in the latest uh, Asian development annual development outlook, um, uh, they're forecasting that developing Asia for the first time in 30 years is going to go faster than China, right? So the, is zero COVID still the right policy for Beijing? And if they keep at it, what does it imply for China and the rest of Asia is the question there. Krishna, do you want to take this on first? Yeah. So, so we have clearly made the point that China is slowing down quite sharply. Again, it's I would identify two factors. One, of course, is a zero COVID strategy, frequent disruptions to production activity, uh, closures of cities and, and towns. And so that's clearly a problem. And uh, that's one factor. The other factor in China also is the real estate sector is is uh, is not doing very well, which is a big part of, uh, of value added in China. So the question, of course, is the interplay of these two factors. So going forward, I think um, China will have to modify its uh, zero COVID strategy, uh, making it uh, more flexible, uh, more targeted, and so on. And and one would hope that uh, after the party congress in October, you'll see uh, a greater opening up. You also see some signs of opening up. But again, the question, of course, is how does that uh, you know how does that you know play out? And then how do they go about addressing the problems in the real estate sector, which is uh, which I think is is equally important in explaining why growth is slowing in China. So I think these two factors need to be addressed. And I think uh, the, the longer China to, it takes to get out of this funk, the, the more the problem is going to be for the region, because many countries, in, in fact, China, uh, sorry, in fact, Japan and Korea have large trade exposures to China. I think China, China is a very important hub in the global supply chain. So how China exists from a zero COVID strategy, how China addresses the real estate crisis is all uh, it's going to, all going to bear upon uh, prospects, not just in Asia, but also globally. Joanna, did you want to weigh in, um, tying that in with what you said earlier about desynchronization of economies in Asia? Sure, right. Look, zero COVID obviously is not good for China's economy. And Krishna already mentioned, you know, there's also this kind of um, compounding effect on the real estate sector. Real estate in itself already has a problem with the deleveraging cycle and all the pressure among the developers. But you really need home sales uh, to help liquefy the balance sheets of developers so things can recover. But when you have an environment where you don't know if your city is going to be locked down, you've had a lot of income hit, there's no roadmap or visibility or certainty about prospects, it really damages your confidence. So in a way, the zero COVID not only has a direct consequence on services activity and high contact services activity and mobility, it also has a compounded effect on other parts of the economy, including confidence, which impacts investment, but also impacts, for example, the real estate. So it's obviously very bad for China's economy. But I have to say, in a way, China's dynamics, to the extent that major parts of the world, maybe outside of Asia, to the extent that major parts of the world really worry about inflation, in essence, China's dynamic zero COVID and periodic lockdown, in a way, uh, is a benign contributor to the global inflation problem. And the reason why I say that is by depressing, suppressing demand in China at a, at a year of so many supply shocks. Imagine if China reopened dramatically, we could have an even worse inflationary problem. And also the other thing I wanted to point out is even though we keep worrying about lockdowns and supply chain issues, the reality is because of the way China does these city specific lockdown, I mean, they're very disruptive. It's obviously very hard for the people's lives in the cities that are being locked down. But because it's not a nationwide lockdown, I think what's been amazing in China is the agility of supply chain and production to resume or shift around different cities logistically such that this uh, this. Uh, containing COVID in localized areas and the outbreaks in localized area, even though it's bad for the economy, surprisingly hasn't really been that disruptive. I would argue not as disruptive to supply chain as people expect. 
which is why when you look at global supply chain pressure indices everywhere, it's been coming off. So in a way, China's dynamic zero has allowed or facilitated some good disinflation this year and did not amplify demand inflation. But of course, going into next year, where we're going into a recession, we hope China can go in the opposite direction. And we actually think China will go in the opposite direction and start reopening. But of course, for China's economy this year, certainly it has amplified the slowdown. If China certainly had uh, this dynamic zero COVID had negative impact, especially not only on the demand side, but also obviously on services chain like tourism. But you know, it's not all, no, there's also substitution effects. I mean, for example, the fact that we've had mm. protracted border lockdowns in Hong Kong, look at the services migration in Singapore, right? You've had substitution of manufacturing into Vietnam. So there are these small substitution effects, but by and large, certainly the region will benefit from China reopening and, and growth rebounding next year. And actually you make the point that one positive has been that it's supported supply chain diversification in countries like Vietnam, India, and Malaysia. Talk us through that. Well, that's, well I'm, I'm not sure. That, I mean, there's a lot of factors that's driving that. I think it, uh, I think the dynamic zero COVID contributed to this desire for diversification. But it's been a positive point as well. It's, well, for those, uh, well, those on the receiving end, yes, but, I think the U.S.-China trade war also yes. uh, has helped Vietnam, and and also <laughs> Vietnam has become part of both the you know the RCEP agreement and the CPTPP, and it's put it in a very mm. good position uh, to attract foreign investment. I want to add just one other word about China. I you know I agree that the zero COVID policy has to normalize because COVID is not ending. And not opening is not sustainable eventually. It's really the path of how they get there and how fast, and we hope it'll be sooner than later. Um, I think the property rights, uh, the property sector issues are not really the key issues. I think they reflect dampened consumer sentiment. They also expect, uh, reflect a very conscious effort by the Chinese government to deleverage this sector because they realize it has suffered from excessive borrowing and lending. Um, so they're trying to balance that, but they have, I think, quite a lot of control over that. They could, <laughs> they could switch gears quickly if they wanted to. My more concern for China going forward in the intermediate term is more structural issues like the population aging. That's going to be a headwind on growth, and also a state-led growth strategy uh, with uh, where I think you you see a lot of private uh, investment even before. Uh, the zero COVID policy, uh, there's kind of a, an uncertainty and chilling effect on investment. Um, and so uh, it's, it, it's a little bit different than earlier reform periods where I think a lot of dynamism in China was generated by, by real competition, open competition, um, a market competition. And uh, so the future direction of uh, economic reforms also will be very important. And the question of um, what's China's new growth model going to be has been around for many years as well. Um, they need to move beyond low cost exports and low cost labor, right? Um, any insights on that, Albert? Well, I think they're doing that. They're moving into higher value added uh, activities. And we know they're leading in some very globally leading technologies like solar chips and 5G, AI, uh, high speed rail. Uh, so they are maturing, I think, in terms of their economic structure. Um, the question really is to maintain growth momentum after all the catch-up growth opportunities have been exhausted somewhat. You know, you really need to create a real innovative system. And although we see a lot of patenting activity in China and some success in, in, uh, in technology increases, um, uh, I think many still question to what extent the you know, that real open innovation system can be um, fostered in, in, in the current model. Okay, now at this point, I wanna move on to the next segment, this time tackling medium term shifts. In particular, I wanted to home in on digital currencies as well as increased digitalization, which you guys have also discussed, as well as deglobalization. The first big question there for me is, is the era of physical currency drawing to an end? I didn't write that question, by the way. That came from a, uh, the IMF Finance and Development magazine. 
It was written by Cornell professor Eswar Prasad, who argues as much, he says, that money is now on the cusp of a transformation that could reshape finance and, in consequence, the structure of society. So what do you think? And if you do agree, what does this mean for Asia, which, as we know, has emerged as a top adopter of currency? Krishna, I'm going to go to you first on this. So, so <clears throat> let me say that, that global monetary and payment infrastructure is going through profound shifts uh, with the advent of new technologies such as distributed ledgers, right? So application of these new technologies can potentially reduce uh, produce many efficiency gains, productivity gains for the global financial system. They can increase financial deepening. They can increase financial inclusion and so on. But I would argue that right now they are still in an infancy stage in terms of application adoption. And so there's still a need for physical currencies among uh, countries that are not particularly tech side. So you're going to see for some time, you're going to see uh, uh, both existing together. Uh, and, and, and we are entering a phase, a period when physical and digital currencies will coexist and serve different purposes and user groups, right? And, and I would argue that Asian currencies are at the forefront of innovation and adopting digital technologies for financial infrastructure with central banks such as China actively developing CBDCs uh, and private sector playing, uh, you know, different use cases for digital assets, such as uh, for remittances. So I think this is a process which is which is uh, both exciting, uh, the innovation has to be welcome, but I think what we need is some kind of a, 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 a consistent and a generalized uh, regulatory framework, which makes sure that we get the benefits of digitalization of CBDCs and cryptos and while while safeguarding against the risks that these pose, both in terms of uh, issues of data governance, privacy, financial stability, and, and greater volatility. So yes, it's very promising. We're going to see coexistence of physical and digital currencies, but what we need also are robust uh, uh, and, and, and consistent regulatory frameworks so that we reap the benefits while limiting the risks. Before we dive into CBDCs, I wanted your thoughts as well, Joanna. Same question: Is the era of physical currency drawing to an end? I mean, I agree with. I mean, Krishna really kind of, you know, kind of explained the whole argument and you know what digital currencies can provide. But I certainly think it's too premature to say this is the end of it. We're not at that point yet, right? So obviously, we are headed towards a lot of progress, and clearly, uh, there's been a lot of progress we made over the last couple of years. But I think you know we're still a little bit way off. And again, we have all these fragmented regimes. We have different countries at different pace. So, you know, uh, it's, it's too premature to say at this point. And, uh, but I, I definitely think there's a lot of potential uh, going forward. There's a lot of potential indeed. Um, and there's growing risks and benefits of this competition between official uh, currencies, as CBDC, central bank digital currencies and private currencies. On the one hand, you have, I mean, the, the problem is the dark side of cryptocurrency assets persists, remains very pervasive, right? They're still being used a great deal for money laundering and illicit activities to evade taxes and so on and so forth. So then you have the policymakers going, okay, let's just build our own digital currency. But on the other hand, won't CBDCs just foster government overreach, right? Going against the very... Um, mandate of digital currencies, of decentralization, and are CBDCs really the safer and more inclusive alternative? Krishna, your thoughts, please. So again, I, I, I would like to just reiterate the point I made, you know, interest and work towards CBDCs in Asia, I mean, again, I'm focusing on Asia, we're going to talk about Asia here, has been gaining momentum for some time, right? And the Asia Pacific region uh, covers countries uh, in a wide uh, spectrum of income groups and stages of financial development. So one has to see this in terms of where we are across different countries, what are the benefits of these new technologies, whether it's CBDCs or cryptos and so on, try to make, try to maximize the benefits they offer. And there are many, many benefits from, you know, digitalization. You can think in terms of uh, improving payment efficiency, uh, financial deepening, financial inclusion, and so on and so forth. There are clear benefits from this. But at the same time, there are risks here. We are thinking in terms of uh, risks to privacy, data governance, uh, excessive volatility, uh, and, and risks to financial stability. So one has to see this in a more holistic way and say, okay, how do I get the best out of this while limiting the risks? And I think that's where it's important to talk about uh, you know, regulatory and supervisory frameworks 
which reflect the advances uh, in technology, the advances in digitalization, in digitalization across countries. So I would I would say that that should be the focus. You know, when you when you travel to different parts of Asia, there's a debate on whether you should regulate cryptos, whether you should ban cryptos, and so on and so forth. But I think the the, the point here is. There are benefits to technology. There are benefits to digitalization and, and innovation. Let's try to reap the benefits of this while trying to limit it, while trying to limit the risks. And that calls for, you know, more generalized, well-regulated uh, regulatory and supervisory frameworks, which I think is what is where uh, we are heading towards. That's going to be a very delicate balance because I think the knee-jerk reaction is always, all right, it's time to regulate it. Right. Um, any any insights, Joe, on how uh, governments across Asia should be looking into this? I mean, I mean, that, unfortunately, everything is a trade off. Right. You can't always have your cake and eat it, too. Right. You don't want to have completely unregulated. It's pretty much, you know, Krishna said there's also a lot of risks that we need to manage as well. Right. So, uh, you know, again, all the countries are in different stages of development. You want to find a good regulatory framework. You want to safeguard against risk, but you want to foster innovation efficiencies and financial inclusion. So. We have to balance this, and unfortunately, I, I I do think that you know governments will play a very large role here. I mean, it, you know, it's not like you know governments are willing to just forego, uh, you know, and allow private sectors all CBDC just to take over. It's certainly in some governments where you know there needs to be some kind of you know concerns about range of potential financial stability risks that may be involved, and you know, but we just need to have enough regulation to secure data privacy so people, you know, do feel a level of confidence, right, that it doesn't, it, it there's not an overreach. Um, so obviously those privacy issues, those data governance are going to be very, very important. I mean, everything is a balancing act, right? Um, in, in looking at the pros and cons versus private versus CDC. Let's zoom out a bit on this uh, topic of increased uh, digitalization and automation. And Albert, you touched on this earlier about how it's a massive opportunity. Um, what specifically are the implications for Asia's medium term growth? And here I want to highlight the rich poor divide when it comes to technology which you also touched on in your in your comments earlier isn't the worry is the worry is that could it not boost productivity for some countries some economies but then eliminate jobs in certain other places of course but i don't think we uh, should or can be fearful of new technology and even uh, the central bank digital currencies i think it'll be a good thing because as joe said I think everyone's approaching it cautiously and they're figuring it out, uh, but they'll figure out a way to make it be beneficial. Uh, and I, I really hope that um, just as digitalization more generally, governments in particular focus on how to make digital technology, including central bank digital currencies or use of blockchains and payment systems, which um, ADB is supporting uh, experimental efforts with ASEAN plus three countries. Um, to figure out a way to make them inclusive and, and really make a focus of that. I think when we see many new technologies uh, becoming more important, including AI going online, um, I think governments need to realize that these technologies can be quite devis divisive in terms of uh, just rewarding skilled workers as opposed to unskilled workers. But it doesn't have to be inevitable, especially in terms of how these technologies can be used uh, by the public sector education reforms, other areas, um, but all healthcare systems to make those systems more inclusive, uh, but also for households and firms as well. But that re really requires more investment and not just in uh, ICT infrastructure, but also digital literacy, um, uh, information systems that can help people, uh, especially small firms, understand how to take advantage of uh, the digital access. Uh, and also complementary reforms that make trade uh, uh, fairly costless, paperless, um, with standardized standards across countries, uh, interoperability, so that a small firm could actually contemplate really exporting a digital product or service. And one thing just to note is that, uh, you know, service trade globally is growing, it's the fastest growing part of trade. And within services trade, digital services trade is most of it and, and, and by far the fastest growing. And Asia, if you look at the last 15 years, has gained, it's the one part of the world that has actually gained market share in digital services trade. But the ecosystem supporting digital 
economy really vary quite a lot. We have some of the top countries in terms of uh, Singapore, Korea, in digital um, in the digital environment. But then uh, many countries in developing Asia really need to make a lot more investments in many areas to really facilitate this type of opportunity. Uh, so I think that's a priority. It's not really a matter of what you know whether you choose to allow digitalization to occur or not. It's happening, you know. So it's you're either in the game or you're not, and you either think of ways to make it work for uh, inclusivity or kind of suffer the consequences of that not happening. So certainly, developing Asian countries have a lot of catching up to do in terms of um, the technology. Um, it's interesting that when we talk about digital currencies, we're really talking about the concept of decentralization, right? But then, again, when we zoom out and we come back to what we were talking about earlier, and one of the risks, as you guys pointed out, is deglobalization instead in the real world that's happening. Um, and that's a possible medium-term risk as well. It's uh, The IMF, I believe, calls it economic geofragmentation. Uh, this issue was again underscored by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which, you know, disrupted trade flows, trade flows, and laid bare different political ideologies. How worried should we be again in Asia of this, and what can policy makers do? Um, Christian, I'm going to go to you first because this is uh, this goes precisely against the mandate of the IMF. Then we go to Joanna afterwards. I, I, I think it would be fair to say that even before. Um, the pandemic and the war, there was a lot of angst against globalization, right? And I think uh, it was partly a, the fact that uh, it's clear that globalization has led to increasing incomes across the world, across countries, notably in Asia, right? A lot of people have gained from globalization and so on. But I think where uh, more emphasis could have been placed is on redistribution in terms of, you know, clearly the many winners, but they were also losers from globalization. And so did public policy do enough to compensate losers uh, uh, so that so that everybody is this together? Now, going beyond globalization, what we've seen is uh, because of the war and so on, there's an increasing um, risk of fragmentation. I mean, you saw some of that with China, US tensions, but then you've seen more in terms of uh, following the war, how uh, the world is quite divided and whether you call it in different blocks or so on and so forth, there is a clear uh, issue of fragmentation, both in terms of geopolitics, when you look at payment systems and so on and so forth. So is that there, is there a risk for the, for the future of the global economy? I think it clearly is. And I think some of the work which we'll be putting out during our forthcoming um, regional economic outlook for Asia, you'll see that we've done some very illustrative scenarios, some based on some assumptions that this kind of fragmentation uh, can have significant losses for countries, uh, especially those which have benefited a lot from globalization, from supply chains, and so on and so forth. So I think this is something which we need to be worried about, and it's something that in all, all of us should will need to work together to make sure that people, one, that globalization is appreciated, that we reduce, that we do a better job of making sure that everybody is in it together, that we also work together towards reducing uh, the potential fragmentation, uh, so the signs of which we are seeing, uh, you know, happening re in recent times. Earlier, you talked about active engagement between policymakers as being key. What does that look like in practice? Well, I, I, you know, again, we have various fora where policymakers talk, uh, and I think it's important to continue the dialogue. I think there's nothing better than working through dialogue and discussion and I think uh, you know that kind of engagement has to continue. We have to find ways by which uh, countries engage with, with with each other actively. Uh, there are going to be differences, and one has to find ways by which we sort out our differences without undermining uh, a, a you know a global good. And I think that's very very important. Joanna, your thoughts, please. Yeah, no, I just want to add, look, I think obviously we have to worry about deglobalization because of a lot of the narratives and obviously geopolitics, uh, politi you know, geostrategists always worry about it. But, you know, if you look at the actual data, uh, you look at the activity of global goods, in especially goods trade, goods trade intensity, uh, with all the talk about deglobalization, actually goods trade intensity increased over the last couple of years. So the evidence is not yet convinced. It, it's not clear yet in the evidence that we are already deglobalizing. Of course, the risk going forward is there. And we've, as I said, we've had increased goods trade intensity. 
Uh, so far, if, even if you look at services trade, actually, if you remove travel, uh, service trade in, uh, continues to be on an upward secular trend. Uh, but I do think, you know, we are, I think right now it, it's not, the jury is out whether this is the end of globalization. I think what could be happening is we're obviously, I think the nature of globalization is changing. Patterns are changing. Of course, Asia benefited a lot from the productivity and efficiency gains from globalization. But to the extent that, you know, obviously there'll be some winners and losers, I think there's going to be some shifting patterns uh, clearly in the case of China as kind of the, ma the major source of magnet for global FDI and manufacturing, that may change over time as some of the geopolitical risk premiums are factored in, uh, including other concerns about you know, regulatory regimes as well. But that could provide some opportunities for other parts of East Asia. And I'm just hoping that since there's a lot of Asian markets with greater integration and more economies like in RCEP, if you can move things around, even if maybe there's an overall, maybe it may not be the most productive arrangement of supply chain, but if overall you can redistribute some of the productivity gains in some markets that can actually benefit, at least for parts of the region, it's not going to be, there could be, again, uh, hopefully, if, that's why it's so important to maintain opportunities for regional trade agreements so that if these risks happen, there's flexibility in realignment of supply chain. Let's say if people want to diversify out of China, you shift, you just shift your production around, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you completely re remap your, your supply chain across Asia. You're just moving for different China for China, parts of other Asia for other parts of the world. And so therefore, hopefully you mitigate some of the welfare losses from what could happen from an outright uh, deglobalization. So I think it's right now the jury's out in the data. And I think there's a lot of moving parts, but certainly the risks going forward are there with the political environment and all the other factors with US-China tensions and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is something we have to watch out for. So the data is I, at least showing that we're all still tightly linked to each other. Albert? Yeah, I, I want to agree that I think the demise of globalization is greatly exaggerated. And uh, not to say we uh, don't need to be very attentive to uh, make the multilateral trading system healthier than it currently is. I also want to point out that uh, one thing that has happened with, I think, the U.S.-China trade war and then uh, the massive sanctions, unprecedented mm -hmm. sanctions against Russia, it's created a, quite a lot of uncertainty <laughs> for everyone around the world in terms of not knowing what could happen in the future. And that, I think, the uncertainty, as we know, has the biggest effect on investor sentiment and gets their attention because that's what business people uh, fear the most. The other thing I wanted to point out is that um, you know, in, in the G20, there's going to be a strong message from the Indonesian presidency that uh, Asia has benefited from global trade developing countries, emerging markets have benefited and still are very committed to open trade, open investment, multilateral, open, and to the extent possible, open multilateral trade. And that's a message that the, the G20 forum is one where the voice of emerging markets should be louder than just the G7. Um, but I think that reflects, you know, when we have a lot of uh, ADB governors and ministers coming uh, here for the ADB annual meetings. And I think there's a broad sentiment that this has been good for Asia. ADB has always been very supportive of regional economic integration efforts. And we see, um, as was mentioned, greater integration occurring within the Asia region, even more than with the rest of the world. And Asia itself accounts for such a huge part of the world, if you think about the countries involved in the RCEP agreement, for instance, that there is still a momentum, a healthy momentum towards globalization. And I don't see a threat of deglobalization, maybe some changes in the nature of globalization. But thankfully, we're not there yet. Albert, I'm going to stay with you as we head into this final segment of the day. Uh, we're talking about long term goals. And by that, I mean the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals and climate change. Um, as we keep pointing out, public finances are in much worse shape as we exit the pandemic. And I'm wondering, what does all of that imply for much needed investments in infrastructure and health and education and public services, right? And especially in um, developing Asia. And to be more blunt, the question there is, are the SDGs still attainable by 2030? Which when you think about it, it's really just seven years away now. Well, I think we have to do our best. SDGs are obviously aspirational goals. Um, we want to do as well as we can, and I think it'll be understandable if huge setbacks make progress slower than we had hoped. Um, I think um, 
I think it's correct that the current uh, fiscal space in many countries is very limited. And so uh, governments have to make very difficult choices. Uh, and, you know, Krishna had mentioned that they need to target the subsidies more, even if that's unpopular. Um, we've also been emphasizing since earlier this year the need to mobilize more tax revenues, even though that, too, can be tough. Uh, but there are certainly ways to do that. Uh, Asia, still the tax revenue as a share of GDP is still well below uh, developed uh, economies and some other even emerging economy regions. Um, and so that can provide more fiscal space. Um, more broadly, you know, if you think about the big challenge of climate change, uh, which is Everyone talks about how huge the fin financing need. ADB hopes to be the climate bank of uh, Asia and has made a big financial commitment, $100 billion by 2030, to support uh, climate change efforts to address the climate change challenge. Um, and one thing that we are focusing on is the need to leverage private sector money. And we, we're uh, strongly supporting efforts to issue green bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds, that can uh, direct private sector investment, but also to uh, come up with new types of financing mechanisms like the energy transition mechanism that tries to leverage uh, funding from both the private sector, other donors, and our own funds to try to uh, make a difference in promoting the green transition. Could you talk a little bit more about that fund uh, beyond um reducing carbon footprint and clean energy and I guess sustainable transport. What else is in there? What else can um, governments around the, uh, around the region tap into? Well, we're doing, we have quite a, a number of different funds. I think the one that has gotten the most attention um, uh, in terms of uh, ADB, uh, new models of finance is the energy transition mechanism, which is being developed in several Southeast Asian countries. Um, where there's two funds, one to help finance the early retirement of coal-fired power plants and a separate fund to support investment in renewables to replace that energy. And alongside of that is a strong commitment to ensure a just transition by making sure that those uh, workers, especially coal miners, uh, but others as well who are adversely affected, there that there is attention paid uh, to uh, making sure that uh, they're not left behind in the transition. And that also requires, I think, much stronger social protection systems, which is another major area of uh, future focus, I think, uh, for the bank. So lots of opportunities there. Uh, Joanna, this transition to net zero is um, obviously a key uh, pillar of the uh, uh, the SDGs, what are specifically the key opportunities and challenges for Asia as we move along this path? Well, obviously, different. There's some economies that could be more vulnerable uh, to trans. There's, you know, different, different places have different um, mitigation risk, transition risk. I mean, obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in certain industries. As you know, China has taken the lead on EV, and uh, you know, I think Indonesia now. Uh, we just put out, City actually just put out a piece about the sort of the developing growth of the EV battery supply chain. So there are certainly opportunities in Asia to provide, you know, to kind of latch on to the supply chain that creates these growth industries, these new growth green industries, that will be the future that will help get us to net zero. But we also have to factor in that there's also going to be these costs, right? I mean, uh, you know, whether you can make a smooth transition and some, you know, some economies, you know, um, you know, should they have the same goals of net zero as others when you have a different level of economic development? I mean, you know, the ability to transition between rich economies and poor economies. And obviously, when you have these big disasters like what happened in Pakistan, there's also the question of, well, you know, is there any compensation for other economies that are going through the, the effects of climate change? So because there's, you know, again, finding multilateral solutions to this big, big problem uh, with varying countries, varying experiences of various transition risks, mitigation risks, different costs of transition, uh, and then obviously, but there are opportunities. And I think, you know, some economies are better positioned for that. And we need, I mean, obviously, uh, there's also a question for the lower income economies that maybe the transition cost is much harder. Uh, you know, hopefully there'll be some support uh, from concessional, from multilateral agencies to provide that opportunity for them. Um, yeah, so coming up with a, a fair, equitable way to reach these climate goals. Uh, of course, we want to be able to reduce transmission, but I, I certainly think 
uh, not everyone uh, you know, emits per capita the same. So the, it's depending mm -hmm. on who's supposed to bear the consequence or not. The other thing I have to say that I think is a risk for Asia, which I am kind of uh, mindful of watching, is as you know, Europe is in the forefront of this transition risk, right? And certainly with what's happening with Russia, there's kind of this accelerated push to kind of decarbonize and move to other cleaner technology. Uh, one thing that we have to watch out for, because obviously we're in a different transition path to other places like Europe, is the regulatory regime. Like we're such a, you know, global trade is very, very important. And, and going down in the future, if Europe, for example, goes towards, uh, you know, carbon border adjustment mechanism, you know, these tariff regimes based on carbon emissions, again, those are things that could create more trade fictions. We're already talking about risk to deglobalization. So, you know, regulatory, you know, regimes around climate and carbon border adjustment related to climate could again be a potential uh, risk, for example, for Asia to the extent that you know we may not. Some economies are not as well positioned uh, versus others. Where do you stand on this concept of climate justice, um, wherein richer nations have to compensate the poorer um, economies? Take uh, taking the case of um, Pakistan, for example. I mean, the floods have decimated them, and yet they contribute less than 1% to total global emissions. So I was wondering what you thought about this, this, this whole idea behind climate justice. Are you addressing everybody? <laughs> uh, to join multilateral like, agencies, not again. for private <laughs> Krishna, did you want to weigh in or Albert? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I wanted to say something. Should... Go ahead, Albert, go ahead, please. No, sorry. I, I, I... I think, uh, you know, the developed countries have already recognized that they have a financial obligation to help support uh, these efforts in poor countries. That has been part of the earlier, you know, COP uh, agreements. And uh, it's been hard for the rich countries to actually meet all of the commitments they've made. Uh, but I think that there's a strong recognition of this uh, principle of common but differentiated responsibilities based on the historical um, emissions uh, patterns of different countries, but also uh, it's in everyone's self-interest. The, the fact is that we have to help the poorer countries meet this challenge and they're going to need money uh, for financing and they're also going to need technology. And we need to make technologies also more available, uh, have very free trade in technologies and focused uh, arrangements to promote FDI in green technologies in a way that can be attractive. Um, and and support uh, other countries because you know we're we're all in it uh, together uh, at the end of the day. Um, anyway, I'll turn it over to Krishna. I, I, I thanks thanks. I agreed a lot with what Albert and and, and Joe said. I think there's an issue here that uh, I think everybody recognizes the fact that we all have to work on this together. I think from the from the country from the developing country perspective, it's a question of uh, how do we get uh, financing, how do we get technology, as Albert mentioned. The question is how do you incentivize? Going beyond that, how do you incentivize the private sector to come in? What role can the uh, multilateral development banks play in trying to catalyze financing for the private sector? But let's be clear that the public sector on its own cannot address the issues of climate change. You need financing from the private sector. How do you get that private financing? How do you catalyze that through the role of uh, MDBs and what countries themselves do in terms of say, whether it's a carbon pricing or not? I think one issue, which I just wanna go back to what Albert said is, you know, this issue of how do you create fiscal space to address the SDGs and climate, uh, you know, some of the climate uh, goals. And I think here, uh, digitalization can play a very important role, both in terms of rationalizing expenditures and in terms of your boost and, and, and in terms of boosting your tax revenue. So from the countries can move on that on their front. At the same time, they'll need help from uh, the, the uh, multilateral institutions and the private sector. How do you get all this going? Can you think in terms of framework where you marry the macro and micro reform so that the private sector has an incentive to come in? Uh, what kind of incentives are they looking for? Or do they want you know, a carbon pricing? Or what else can you think in terms of uh, measures that would entice the private sector to come in? I think that's a key role we have to play because without the private sector playing a big role in this, I think the challenge of addressing climate change is going to be very difficult. Technology is very, very important. Again, that's something which I've heard from all countries I've been to in terms of um, 
in, in, in terms of addressing the climate change, uh, uh, climate uh, challenge. Yeah, some very good points there, there Krishna. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Albert. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a, a, these are really good comments. I, there's a lot of really critical governance issues that need to be addressed to attract private investment, especially in renewables and what um, yeah. uh, some some things that uh, multilaterals can help by de-risking loans through public-private kind of mixed lending. But uh, but there's some more fundamental issues about uh, incentives in terms of price incentives. You know, a lot of uh, developing countries have quite controlled energy pricing underdeveloped kind of electric grids and without real progress in those areas, let alone, you know, the need eventually to shift to some sort of carbon trading or carbon taxation or or emissions trading or carbon trading scheme, uh, including border adjustment. I mean, that probably once uh, things are mature, that's probably going to have to be a part of the, the equation as well. Those are uh, <laughs> Those are quite at immature stages in most of the world and certainly in most of Asia. And so there's still enormous work uh, to do on the governance side to make sure uh, governments have the capability to come up with a broader strategy of institutional reform and a strategy for the specific investments that will unleash uh, the most efficient path to net zero. And uh, ADB is also you know, gearing up to provide this uh, support for this type of, 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 of help as well. I mean, I, uh, de-risking investments is something I believe you guys are already doing, but I seem, I feel like that the problem with carbon issue, with, with concepts like carbon pricing is, again, it's not very popular, is it? No, it's hard, hard work. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, you know, it's happening. You know, we have China, we have, uh, you know, India's piloting some schemes. Korea. So uh, I think the countries that feel they really need to make progress, I think, uh, want to understand the opportunities. And of course, it helps when more countries are doing it, because at the end of the day, that has to be integrated. Krishna? Sorry, I didn't. So I, I, I think, you know, you, you're right about one thing that uh, carbon pricing isn't particularly popular in the Asia region. But I think if you go that route in terms of, you know, we've at the IMF, we've tried to uh, we have pushed this issue of uh, international uh, carbon price floor and so on. I think countries also have to see that if they do embark on carbon pricing, that they do get financing. Uh, from 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 the advanced countries, they do get technology. So I think it, it's it's a package of measures which has to be thought through. And uh, otherwise, in, in just in isolation, at this point in time, carbon pricing may not be so popular. But if it is, if people, if countries do see that you know on their part they do carbon pricing, that provides uh, an incentive for the private sector to come in. Great, and it's also supported by financing from uh, developed countries and also technology transfer. I think that plus the push towards renewables will take you a long way. But I think it, it has to be a, a, a package of things coming together for this challenge the way seen. And again, as I think Albert mentioned, in, in Asia, you have countries which face mitigation risks, uh, you know, transition risk and adaptation risks, and they are all really. So you can't think about, you know, one, uh, one set of uh, things for all countries. So we have to tailor the kind of, uh, uh, in a policy advice we give to countries, uh, but also it has to be in the context of a coordinated set of actions, carbon pricing, uh, technology transfer, financing, and catalyzing private capital. I think all this is very important. And the role of MDBs is very important in this context. I'm happy that Albert talked about the role ADBs playing in Asia. That's a great point about having to tailor solutions to the, to the markets. Now we've come to the end of the session. Unfortunately, I mean, we could talk all day, I could talk all day with you guys, but unfortunately that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I do like to end on a positive note always. So despite the heavy topics of today, let's try, yeah? Before the COVID-19 pandemic set back progress on things like poverty reduction, on digitalization and globalization, on cleaner energy, on everything we talked about. Before it did that, there had been some momentum. There had been some green shoots, right? Um, the question to you guys, as you give your two minute closing remarks is what do policymakers, what do, what should policymakers do to get us back on track? And what is there to look forward to? Joanna, I'm going to kick off with you, please. 
Okay, well, I certainly think uh, in this challenging backdrop, you know, I think there's an opportunity here to really, you know, sort of get your house in order to kind of, if there's any, you know, especially when global, when the easy gains of say, you know, global growth and trade become more challenging, you want to focus on domestic reforms, the opportunities to kind of improve productivity, uh, improve connectivity, improve efficiency, deregulate, liberalize. There's obviously opportunities for structural reforms that can help boost your productivity growth. You should try to find opportunities for that. You know, when we talk about digitization, automation, clearly the ability and the importance of upgrading skills to improve your long-term growth process are important. I think the other thing, obviously, that is hopefully a positive catalyst in the region that can make the region a little bit more of a standout amidst the doom and gloom is I'm really hoping that China really makes an orderly transition out of its dynamic zero COVID so that we have this synchronized growth engine, which I think is also good for China, good for boosting of confidence and good for kind of restoring a kind of normal activity and mobility that can help the rest of the, provide also the rest of the region. And I also think that once you allow opportunity for open border, there's more ability for business cross-border pollination of ideas, trade and investment, that again, will be very good for the region. Um, so I think, you know, I think, I think these are, you know, I think trying to figure out structural reforms to boost your domestic productivity growth and also trying to find opportunities to enhance connectivity, to fight against these deglobalization trends, and hopefully China reopening can provide kind of a bright spot for Asia. Get your house in order. That's great advice. Thanks, Joe. Krishna? Again, I think Joanna uh, stole the thunder here by making many of the points I was trying to make. <laughs> I was going to make. I think the issues, some of the issues, topics were discussed in terms of uh, risk of deglobalization, risk of uh, fragmentation, all climate change. All this calls for greater dialogue and working together. I think it's very important that countries work together, see uh, see the global good in all of this. And so that's very important. And, you know, dialogue and discussions with the global fora, whether it's a G20, uh, whatever it is, I think it's very, very important. We need to continue that going forward. We need to approach this uh, from the sense of what is good for the next generations to come, what's good for the, the world at, at, at large. So I think that kind of cooperation, collaboration, coordination is very, very important. I think the point which Joanna made is, yes, we can rely upon all of this, but you have to get your house in order. Many countries in the region face declining productivity, uh, you know, a lot of uh, scarring from the pandemic because of kids haven't gone to school. So I think they need to use technology, they need to get their house in order, use uh, digitalization to address fiscal problems, fiscal issues, and also the, the scarring from the pandemic. I think it's very important. I think digitalization provides you a, a, a hope. I mean, I think it's very, very important, whether it's in public finances, finance, uh, financial sector, I think it's very important. And I think beyond that i think we we need to uh, i think for uh, institutions like the imf adb we need to work together to address many of these challenges because nobody can do this on its own and i think that's where uh, partnerships collaboration is very very important i think that will be key in addressing many of the challenges we, we face today great points there too thank you krishna albert so i definitely want to end on an optimistic note i don't think we can uh look too much in the past, we have to look forward uh, about the opportunities ahead of us. And I'm encouraged by the fact that despite all of the downward growth projections, Asia still is the part of the world that is most dynamic in terms of having the highest growth rates and will be contributing enormously to global growth going into the future. And that does reflect quite a lot of dynamism, quite a lot of pragmatic management, disciplined workers across the region who have really made uh, development happen in many respects. Now, of course, the, all of the immediate macro risks need to be managed carefully by governments. But I think as we continue to get through these headwinds and recover from the pandemic, we still have to keep our eyes squarely on the longer term goals, which are the SDGs. And in particular, climate change and poverty reduction which I think are the two core kind of uh, objectives for what uh, the ADB and I think many uh, organizations and governments are trying to focus on. And to do that, we need to not be fearful of technology, but embrace the opportunities and shape the opportunities that technology creates in ways that can be inclusive. We need to uh, double down, I think, on globalization and again, find the opportunities where it can promote 
inclusive uh, growth, but overall growth, especially for poorer countries so that they become uh, more engaged in the global economic system. And we need to keep investing in people. And that's really an important message because um, you know, I, I mentioned that the, the World Bank has an interesting recent report where they estimated that learning poverty, which measures the percentage of 10 year olds who cannot really read properly, uh, was 57 percent even before the pandemic. And the pandemic increased it to 71 percent. So this is just such an enormous challenge and important for uh, the region's future addressing the learning loss issue, but addressing the more core learning poverty issues. Um, and it's not just a basic uh, literacy and numeracy, but also digital literacy. These things need to all be considered uh, as we invest in the future. So embrace the opportunities and look to the future. Thank you for that uh, fantastic advice, Albert. And with that, it is my privilege to close this session of the ADB annual meeting titled the Post-COVID-19 Outlook for Developing Asia. Joanna Chua, Krishna Srinivasan, and Albert Park, we thank you so much for your time and fantastic insights today. My name is Regina Lay. Thanks for tuning in.